I really want this Mick Jagger crap to stay in this room. I do not want this walking around the field here. The only thing I have in common with Mick Jagger is age and a love for the blues. Uh, but he, is, he actually is 18 months older than I am. Uh, but I have done so many less drugs than he has <laughs> that we don't look like we're from the same cohort. Um, it's a real honor to be here. This is a great uh, group and a great occasion and great company to be in. Um, and I'm concerned about living up to the hype and so I've, I, I will just tell you now, I'm probably gonna stammer a little bit and be uneasy, and that's just how it is. And we'll get better as we go along, because I get into the material. I have learning goals, which I'm not gonna spend time on, and um, I also didn't give you my um, uh, disclaimer or my financial, I'm not making any I'm not working for anybody else here, just working for you. Um, so what I'm, I'm doing is similar to what you've heard. It won't be that different. What I'm hoping is that hearing it from not just another mouth, but in a different way of being presented won't feel redundant, that it'll feel like we're still learning, it's still a little bit fresh. So. But it, and I will get to some things that um, uh, Perinda and Octavio did not and, uh, talk about, but let's, let's start out, it's gonna start out similar. And that is that the current transformation in healthcare is evidence-based, and it's in quotes because it's not in the usual sense of evidence. But it's evidence-based in the sense that evidence is finally coming together. Um, it's coming in front of our, our eyes. We're putting it, and you're gonna hear stories about evidence that has been around for a long time that wasn't, was in the wrong literature. We didn't, we didn't know it because it wasn't in our literature, it was in somebody else's literature. So the impact of primary care on cost and quality, that's stuff that started coming up in the very late 90s and early 2000s. Um, the evidence of behavioral health needs driving up the cost of medical care. That's um, really starting to be um, shown on a population basis uh, in the 2000s. Evidence the impact of treatable behavioral health needs on productivity of the workforce. That's stuff that was always there, but it was out in, the, in other literature, and we'll get to that. Let's talk a little bit about uh, what makes some medical care primary care. I said this because I thought I was talking to psychologists when I came down here. That because most psychologists don't really know that. They think of medicine and it's kind of all one thing. And um, we think of all doctors as we don't distinguish them very much. They are the people we are just as good as. And uh, so, and they all have the, we make stereotypes about them. But in the medical world, they distinguish each other quite well. And primary care is different and is fundamentally different. So primary care, it's the first contact. Thing you go to first, it goes on all the time. It, we know you over time. We're the ones who know that when Bob says, I'm feeling a little down today, it's likely to be an emergency because he never complains and he never comes in. And when Bill comes in and says, this is my last day on earth, I just came by to tell you that I'll be dying today, that we give him a cup of tea and say, there, there, it'll be fine. It's about knowing people in context and being able to make judgments out of relationship, not just out of symptoms. Um, that it's comprehensive, that you, can't, you always came to the right place. This was never the wrong door to come to. May not be where you stay, but it was a good place to start. Um, and if we ain't got it, we'll help you get it. We, we will help coordinate your, uh, your trip through the medical world as Octavio's uh, thumb study showed. 
and it's care for the undifferentiated patient. That's what we are here. We are undifferentiated patients, meaning that when you walk in the door and something's wrong, we don't know. Somebody's got to figure out where do we start? What are all the things we don't need to do first? What are the things we need to do first? What's the general area of what's wrong here? Because people present very complex things going on. And the other thing is, and if we don't get it right now, this today, you're going to come back. We're going to keep at this. So you want somebody in primary care who can tell pretty quickly if this is likely to kill you. And if it's not, who can work with you till we get it figured out. Other specialties, including mental health, expect people to come pre-sorted. We know the problem. You came to see me because I'm specialist in that. Um, and then we'll see how, how we treat you. This is data. How many people have seen this slide? Oh, good. This is cool. Uh, so, so all of the dots here are states. And they are plotted in their cost per Medicare beneficiary against the number of primary care physicians per 10,000 people in the state. And so the, the trend line is really clear. The more primary care docs you have in a state, the cheaper the cost. So that's because they, um, the, the, is that, or is that because they are keeping people from getting to the good care and the specialists? No, it's just the opposite. This is quality ranking across the states, Medicare quality ranking, plotted against the same number of primary care docs per 10,000 people. And what you see is the more primary care docs per 10,000 people, the higher the quality ranking. That primary care, when, when, I mean, this is, about the only area where people say, well, let's, let's do more of something and it'll save us money. Everything else you do more of costs more. And primary care goes against that logic. This is data you heard earlier, but it's a different presentation. I got this slide from Eduardo Sanchez, who at the time was the chief medical officer of Blue Cross Blue Shield in Texas. And it is a slide showing the cost of poor employee health to employers. And what you see is that the whole spend on health care, that's medical care, mental health care, pharmacy is one-fourth of the cost of poor employee health. And the rest of the cost is in lost productivity. And the lost productivity is in absenteeism and presenteeism. Presenteeism, we're saying this, the same, same data, is I'm here, but I ain't doing much. I really can't concentrate until my wife stops being mad at me, my child isn't sick anymore, I can figure out where I'm going to live, I really can't pay attention to my job. So when you account for the, and when you present this, I, one of the reasons I show this to psychologists is you, you're going to have access to the these slides, if you want, you want to be showing these to other people. You, you, you need to make the case. Perinda says, you're going to have to be advocates. You need to make the case for why we're, what we do is, is valuable. And when you show this to employers and they believe it, all of a sudden, the idea that you would have a bit more spend in a way that would address the product, this productivity, is it seems like the, the trade-off is is pretty clear. And when you add all that together, 
the spend on pro lost productivity and pharmacy and health care. It, it means that depression is the most expensive illness to employers. And obesity is the second most expensive. And anxiety is right up there in the top five. That's what we're losing our money on. And this is a country in which talking about making a difference for employers is part of the message. Part of the message is making a difference for the people who aren't in, the, in, in a position of power to make their own difference. But part of it is to making the, a difference to the folks who are um, paying the bills um, for, because in the long run, it's not even the employers who are paying the bills, it's everybody. It's, it, it comes out of everybody's pocket, either in the form of taxes or in the form of pieces of, of salary. In the, it comes out somewhere. We, we know that in the U.S., uh, this was like four or five, six years ago, we had $1,000 in, in health care in every Chevrolet. And the competitors across the ocean had something like 100 or 200 dollars in health care in their cars and the difference put us at a competitive disadvantage and that language is a language that is um, is easily heard and understood so it means that we we have to find a way to address this and that primary care is the only setting for population approach. That the, the vast majority of folks just won't go to mental health. And in fact, in the US Preventive Services Task Force recommendation on screening for depression in primary care, one of the stipulations is that you have something more to do with people who screen positively than just send them, refer them to a mental health center. Doesn't count as access, doesn't count as a program. They re recommend that you don't screen if that's all you can do. So we, if it's, if it's not in primary care, the vast majority of people don't have access. One of the real um, uh, important contributions of Surgeon General Satcher, I thought, was to say clearly that setting up a door that doesn't fit culturally for a whole group of people doesn't count as making access. Access is something that people culturally will use. Um, so, this is the way I think behavioral health presents in primary care. Um, a lot of these are pretty familiar. Mental health, substance abuse, health behavior change, ambiguous illnesses, I'm gonna say more about that, but that's basically where um, we, we're not really sure what's behind that. We don't have any findings. Um, it's not somatizing really, I mean, to, 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 count, to have somatization disorder, you have to have, what, 13 unexplained symptoms and one of them has to be sexual? Talk about a disease made up by committee, you, you know? And, and a, a, a disease where you can hear the, the different groups saying, well, they've got to have my part in there. Yep. Um, no, it's not somatization disorder. It's wearing your life pains in your body. Chronic illness, uh, behavioral needs, unfamiliar cultural expressions of problems, unfamiliar to the providers, not unfamiliar to the culture. Discovered and undiscovered trauma history, which, with, of which, with which um, primary care is rife, and serious mental illness in and outside of treatment because there are a lot of folks with serious mental illness who are not in the mental health system. And they are only in primary care, and sometimes they like it there. That's where they want to be. 
This is just a quick look at the difference of groups and how they present in terms of percentages. The PHQ 3000 is a group of people, about 3,000 of them, I think, uh, matched to the population of the U.S. The Marillac 500 is 500 sequential patients in a safety net clinic in Grand Junction, Colorado. And each one of them was given a rigorous clinical interview. This was quite a, a study, quite a, a grant that they got. And what you see is that it's two to two and a half to three times the level of need. And this is for major depression, not how many people, not how many are depressed. That's a lot more. It's who make, meets criteria for these concerns. And then unhealthy behavior, well, that's a lot of folks. Actually, smoking now, I think, has dipped to 19%. Obesity has plumped up to 31 or 2%. Um, sedentary lifestyle is people who are impacting their health by not being more active. And non-adherence is actually 100%. 100% of people do not do everything that their doctor would suggest that they do for their health. And uh, what, what they call it, these people, this 100% of people is, they call it making their own decisions. Isn't that weird? Um, when you say that to physicians, they go, oh yeah, really, yeah, I guess that's right. And then their cultural expressions of depression. Looks like when you look cross-culturally at what we would call depression, it suddenly makes the whole idea that we have this entity as if it were a, an, uh, what's, what's the word, an ontological being, this, uh, this depression stuff. A little bit um, not so sure. Every culture has something that looks like what we call depression, but they have different names for it. Um, you find things like appetite changes, sleep changes, psychomotor retardation, and so forth across cultures. All of those are also symptoms of serious illness. All of those are reasons that you would go to see a physician. On the part that we recognize most easily around depression, being down on yourself and being hopeless and guilty and suicidal, that tends to be culturally bound. There's, uh, there was a study by a, an Indian psychiatrist named Jadev who looked at depression in India and where they had depression and where they didn't seem to have depression in India. Didn't mean that everything there, that no one had any troubles, but they didn't have what was recognized as depression. And what he found was that there was a correlation with the influence of the British. And he does this cultural analysis in his paper of depression as a distinctly British phenomenon. Now, I'm not sure that that's fair, but it, it's striking. Uh, there's a book called Crazy Like Us, which looks at the way cultures that didn't have depression got transformed into having depression when the US folks got there with their depression treatment regimes. Um, so it's important to know that people come in with problems and they may or may not fit our diagnostic um, paragraphs, but there we have to ad address them. For instance, diabetes. The yellow is the average number of various diabetes symptoms of diabetics who don't have depression or don't also have a diagnosis of depression. And the blue is people with diabetes who do have a diagnosis of depression. Depression makes your diabetes worse. And here's the 10 most common complaints in primary care. Um, 
the, of visits that were driven by someone came in with a problem. And it's, it reads across. So it's chest pain, back pain, fatigue, shortness of breath, dizziness, insomnia, headache, abdominal pain, swelling, and numbness. And in the study, they went to the physician and they said, in each of these cases, so what did you find in terms of organic pathology for this person? And the physician was able to name a test that didn't come back right or something found on exam in 15% of the cases. 85% there wasn't a medical finding. It's not surprising. You have a terrible headache. We kn it feels medical. It is medical. It's physical. But there won't be a medical finding in all likelihood. And that's true of the vast majority of what we bring to primary care. And for all complaints, the number of uh, findings of, of organic pathology was 26%. So this is setting the, the stage for uh, primary care programs, treat, treatment in primary care. This is a real picture. Um, so you can see that this is CBT done in the exam room, someone doing the CBT uh, circles talking about thoughts and feelings and behavior. And in this case, if you can't read it, the thoughts are, I can't make friends. The feelings are feeling lonely. And the behavior is not going out anymore. And so you can hear some behavioral health clinician got invited in to work with a patient in the exam room and t started talking about their experience of loneliness. and was teaching and saying something to the effect of, well, actually, all these things affect each other. It's hard to change your feelings when you want to, but you can change your behavior. And it turns out that changes your feelings a bit. So maybe we can talk about going out a little more. The one piece of advice is when you want to write on the exam table paper, your ballpoint pen will not work. <laughs> you have to have a Sharpie. And so I don't know if you remember the football player who had a Sharpie in his sock. So there you are. Keep your, keep your Sharpie in your sock. And that way you can teach with the exam paper. I'm talking about the programs that are happening in primary care in a way that's broader than um, the Cherokee program. And I'll get down to inevitably to talking about the Cherokee program as one a great example. But it's important, I think, to conceptualize, have a way of categorizing the various programs that are happening. Um, uh, by the way, I have to stop to say it's after lunch. If you start to feel tired, do not fight your tiredness. Put your head down on the table and take a nap because if you do that, you'll come back real fast and you'll be good to go. If you fight it, if you're like me, it'll just be ugly. So just put your head down. I will not take it personally. Um, so there are programs that are coordinated. In other words, the behavior services and the medical services are in separate locations, often separate organizations. and they, but it is a program in some way, and we'll talk a little bit more about what would make that a program. Co-located means you're in the same spot, but it's two treatment plans. There's a medical treatment plan, there's a behavioral treatment plan. And integrated is you're in the same spot and there's one treatment plan. There's a medical care or there's, there is your care, and it has medical aspects and it has behavioral aspects uh, and those shift according to your need. So here's an example of things that might be, ba that I think are basic to what would count as coordinated care. And it's important to, this is, it is not just a hierarchy and everybody has to march from coordinated care up to integrated care. 
because local situations are, are what they are, and what's possible in one area is not possible in another. One of the things that's happening in the U.S. right now is that mental health centers are sometimes through grant programs and sometimes just on their own, reaching out and wanting to be more connected with primary care and behavioral health, uh, I mean, and uh, medical systems. And, um, and that's going to be what can happen in that area. And so I think we need to have what it would take to make that actually be a program. One is that there's an exchange of information to the, to the extent of appointment arrival uh, notification. The physician says, I'd like you to go to see our colleague over at the men mental health center and finds out whether they get there. What we did, because we refer out of our primary care program to specialty mental health a fair amount, was we went around to all the me specialty mental health people a lot of them aren't coordinated with us, aren't part of our system. And we said, Can, let us have your release of information. And then we said, if we have a release of information that has all of this stuff on it, will you accept it? And they all said yes, they would, as long as it was the same, that their stuff was on it. So we boiled it down to one release. Now, when I make a referral, the person signs it in front of me, the release, now I can fax it to where they're going, and we're, we're free to talk. It's already set. We don't have to, what I would prefer would be to have a limited number of sites that I worked with and to have that already in place in every case for every patient. It shouldn't have to be on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. It ought to be part of something that you sign when you, when you come to this primary care practice or when you come to the mental health center. We work as a team with Johnson & Johnson Primary Care, and if you get your primary care there, we will be exchanging information to such and such extent to work with you, or vice versa. Um, and that you need to have the ability to get together and do planning for tough cases. That you, the, you won't have to do it all the time. You don't have to exchange information to the extent of, if, if over there they're keeping psychotherapy notes, not only do they not have to share them, the physicians do not want to see them. They are not helpful. And so, but at the very minimum, you have to exchange problem lists and you have to exchange med lists. That's got to be done. And if you have a, a bulleted kind of write-up about what goes on and diagnosis and so forth, that would really be important. Um, it's important to remind the behavioral health folks that they are part of the treatment. They're part of the team and they need to know the health issues as well. It's not just that primary care docs are out there collecting information because they think they're the hub of everything. You're somebody who's on the team and if you don't ask somebody about their diabetes or about their smoking, then nobody in the health world is going to ask them for the next year. And so we're all on that team and need to step up. And the specialty folks can be our consults, our backups. The psychiatrist at the specialty place can be backing up the primary care docs in terms of prescribing. And in Massachusetts, we have this set up for child psychiatry. So if you are a primary care doc in Massachusetts, you, it is sort of like Ginsu Knives. You know how at night in the, you're watching TV at one in the morning and Ginsu Knives comes on and they say, operators are standing by. Well, in Massachusetts, if you're a primary care provider treating children, child psychiatrists are standing by. And you can get a child psychiatrist on the phone in half an hour. 
the, some, the state is buying half an hour of that doctor's hour all day long in six sites around the state. And it means that you have enhanced the workforce for treating children immensely because all of these primary care docs who feel perfectly comfortable in initiating a medication, particularly for attention deficit, but not real comfortable in going to a different medication, a higher dose, uh, um, an additional medication, that, that specialty stuff as far as they're concerned. So what they did historically was they stopped treating and referred to specialty care, which took a year. And so this has made us a system that works together better. Let's talk about co-location. The advantages, this, I, I looked this up in the, the um, evidence. Access is a lot better. Patients like it better. Docs like it a lot better. Makes their life happier. It's cost effective. It improves clinical outcome. The problem is if it's still a referral, even though it's internal. And so when in our setting where we had a, a new behavioral health person got co-located in a practice for the first time, and I said to him, Nicholas, I want you to keep track of every first visit that you have, whether or not the person showed up, and whether or not you had met the person before. And if the doc scheduled, which the doc could do, just put him on Nicholas's schedule, he showed up, the people showed up 40% of the time for the first visit. If Nicholas had met them, been introduced by the physician, they showed up 76% of the time, about double. That even when it's co-located, teamwork makes all the difference because for the, phys for the patient, if this person is part of my physician's team, I will work with them, and if I'm going to different care now, I'm not sure I want to do that. I, I also put in there about slow PCP learning curve. Docs know what they already know about mental health and about who needs care, and they did not get trained in medical school about health behavior issues and about other kinds of ways that behavioral health. So all the things that Perinda gets brought in to do at her site, she would not be brought in to do at a site that was just starting up where she would be co-located for the first time. They would wait till they had someone who with significantly obvious mental health issues. That means she would sit in her office and or she would start doing therapy hour for hour to try and make a living. And so the 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 fact that you were waiting for the doc to identify people in co-located sites makes it difficult to get going. And it also means you don't have stuff to communicate about regularly, so things don't go well. There are a couple of models of integrated care in, that are dominant in the country now. One is the impact model and the other is behavioral health consultant model. You heard about the behavioral health consultant model. We'll, highlight it a little bit, but so the impact model was the, comes from the early research on depression, treating depression in primary care, and it's evolved, and now it's to the point, uh, and it's used, for instance, in, in all over the country, but in, in Minnesota, it's everywhere, they call it the diamond model up there. Um, it, people get distracted, I think, in that they look at this and they say there's more evidence for treating depression with the impact model than with other models, so you have to do the impact model. And I want to put that in some context for you. But let's first say what's good about the impact model, which is it's, um, it has a what originally was called care manager, then it got called a depression clinical specialist. This is a psychologist or a social worker in most of the pra practices now, for instance, in the diamond model. It's gone from the days when it was a bachelor's level care manager type person or a nurse care manager type person to 
now someone with behavioral health training, whether it's a nurse or a psychologist or a social worker, but they have real behavioral health training. And they do patient education and symptom and side effect tracking and brief therapy, uh, problem solving therapy in this version, but it's also CBT or behavioral activation with the primary care doc in close consult and backed up by the um, consulting psychiatrist. And this was the research. It, was, it did better. It did good. And usual care there, the red is usual care. And usual care also had the possibility of referral to mental health services. Here's Perinda's flags taken from Cherokee and the behavioral health consultant model. I'm not going to spend any time on it, um, except to say that these models are now, that as you compare them, impact being disease-based, behavioral health consultant being program-based, designed to interlace behavioral health throughout an entire practice. The impact having a research heritage, the behavioral health consultant model having a clinical heritage. The patient outcome evidence and impact is very strong. The cost and satisfaction evidence in the BHC model is very strong. And if you go to the impact people, they will be at pains to say, and we also have cost and satisfaction uh, evidence. And if you spend a little time with my friend Dennis Freeman, who is the CEO, he will show you we have some really strong uh, outcome um, evidence. The care manager is in one, the behavioral health consultant, but often the same discipline. And the models are beginning to converge. If, you t if we had Jurgen Uniter here, who is uh, the psychiatrist from the University of Washington, best known now with uh, the impact model, he will tell you, but you also have to have someone who can deal with life crises. That's part of primary care. You, uh, he would be passionate about don't just work on depression. And if you go to Cherokee, you will find population-based, targeted, protocol-driven programs for patients. So here's a way of putting it together um, that I put together. Uh, so what you see is the primary care practice is the big square. And you have primary care behavioral health in it linked by proximity and protocol. Proximity because you can find a behavioral health person without the doctor having to walk more than 10 or 12 steps. And protocol because for this population we are always going to bring in the behavioral health person. This is a new first prenatal. We're go they're going to see a behavioral health person. This is a child above the 85th percentile of BMI. They're going to see a behavioral health person. So we're, we, we are using both ways of accessing. And they, primary care behavioral health is connected, offering substance abuse and mental health and wellness in a practice that does universal behavioral health screening. And beside it, and whether that beside is co-located in the sense of at Cherokee in the building you saw, the third floor is specialty mental health. So it's right there. In other places, that may be blocks or miles away. But if this whole system is working, the specialty mental health is offering consulting psychiatry, psychotherapy, DBT, meaning training for particularly uh, challenging and challenged populations, and it's linked by referral and collaborative programs. It's a, and that then is the system we're talking about for primary care, and we haven't started to get our minds around what would it look like if we had to have behavioral health as part of all of our system? What if we just didn't want to do OBGYN in a specialty clinic anymore without behavioral health? How about if we never did oncology again without behavioral health right there? 
In our site, you have, we do behavioral health screening in the ER. We, we, those eventually, we're going to be looking at the whole health system, not just primary care. And I have a friend that I know who had a program at a hospital in Portland, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, where he had sold the hospital on the idea that behavioral health is the one constant for everything. And each service had its own little special sub thing, but everybody was going to need behavioral health. And so he had a dispatcher unit down on the first floor. And he had psychologists and social workers on page running out to all the different services in the hospital. <clears throat> and when a service began to use the behavioral health person at a certain level, you got your own person. They just, now you had somebody all the time up there. And of course, primary care already had theirs. So this is the terms, uh, the definition uh, that Octavio did. I'm not going to do it again. Um, Let's talk about um, what the transformation of payment might be like. This is a slide on the Massachusetts primary care payment reform program to try and make this happen. And um, I'm, I'm pointing as if you would, my pointing would help, but it, it sort of, it helps me. So in Massachusetts, this is Medicaid. Right now, practices have signed up, have volunteered for this program. And there are 50 practices in the state that started with this program March 1st. The plan is that eventually all Medicaid practices will be doing business this way. And we're, we're just rolling it out. I, we are still in the optimistic, starry-eyed phase. Uh, if I come back some future time, there will be scars, scabs, all over, because this is really hard stuff. But there are three ways of paying for Medicaid folks. And this is Medicaid people uh, who are under 65 and aren't in the duals program. One is b the bundled payment. And the bundled payment is a per member per month. And it is based on three tiers of payment. And so tier one is a basically the patient-centered medical home. It's care coordination or care management and screening and connection with the medical neighborhood. Tier two is primary care behavioral health. It's somebody is in your practice, a cl licensed clinician, and you are addressing anxiety, depression, substance abuse, you're screening, and you're referring to specialty care as necessary. And tier three is tiers one and two and specialty care, which means you have to have a psychiatrist on staff a full day a week in your practice, and you have to have that person backing up primary care uh, regularly so that your, your physicians are enhanced by that, by that uh, consult consultation. And you're doing longer therapy as well, so that if your patients go somewhere else for mental health care, it comes out of your bundle but you may not coerce them to stay with you. The patient gets to choose. They go wherever they want. So you have to make a program that's so enticing that people will want to stay with you. Then there's uh, a, an incentive for quality and a shared savings payment for if you make your quality numbers for basically risk-adjusted um, uh, savings. And this is, this is hitting Massachusetts like a bomb. My phone started ringing off the hook. People saying, where are we going to get these people? 
I don't know. I, I can't imagine because the workforce is not ready. We are. Uh, first of all, mental health folks, in general at least, don't know the difference between specialty care and primary care generalism. They think everybody's doing mental health. And that difference is, I think, the, the most important difference that isn't, that isn't in people's heads. Because it happens in medicine as well as in mental health. We've seen it all over the place with that. The cardiologist says, I can't believe these primary care people think they're doing cardiology because I do so much better cardiology. And the nephrologist or whoever, all the specialties say, those primary care guys, they don't do this well. And when, it, when people first discovered how much mental health was happening in primary care, they, psychiatry said, well, they, this can't be because they don't really know, they're not as good as I am at that. And the answer is, yeah, that's right. We're not as good as you. But we're doing everything. We see the undifferentiated patient. This, you have to be trained more to do that, not less. You have to be better to do it in 15 minutes than in 50. And so this is a specialty that, um, that, and the difference between generalism and specialty is something that makes a real difference in how you think about this work. Um, the, we have case managers in mental health who really don't know how to do health stuff or care managers in health who, don't, who are uneasy about behavioral health issues and in the PCMH, it's going to be both. The care manager cannot hand it off. When you go to help a complex person and it's their anxiety that's keeping them from taking their medicine for their COPD, you can't say, now I'm going to go get somebody else to treat the anxiety. You've got to be able to do both right there. Physicians and nurses uh, are used to giving advice and teaching. That's, and many of our behavioral health folks are too. And on the one hand, it's, our work can be more directive and more teaching. And on the other hand, when they're not doing what you're directing them and teaching to do, you better have a whole lot of arrows still in your quiver. And often, we don't. And so the whole way of activating people we're just starting to learn about. Um, so we, I, I'm not going to spend time on this. So it's hard for us, if you're trained in specialty m mental health, to go into primary care. It doesn't come naturally. It feels like, I mean, here are all the people who come to see you, and you say, why, do you, why did you come? Why? And, well, Dr. Adler said I should. Well, what makes you think that Dr. Adler, why do you think he would want you to come see me? And I have no idea. That's visit beginning 101. And it's totally OK. It's totally fine. In the mental health setting, that's hard. That's a hard start. It doesn't get going very well often. People don't define what they have as, uh, as mental health needs. We are part of a team. We're not the lead. And the, we've talked about time and confidentiality and instrumentality, meaning you got to do something. You have to add value today, not just shake hands and say, I'll see you on Tuesday. I'm going to teach you something about your breathing. I can take, teach you something so that you can put yourself to sleep at night. I got something I can do for you to get started so it feels like you went to your doctor's office and you learned something th to help your health. Um, this is what I think the generalist needs to have. They need to be able to do. And you don't need to be able to do it the best of anybody in town, but you ought to be able to do it at the first level right now, right here. And I'm not going to read them all out, but that's, and I put organizational transformation agent in there because you're transforming the organization anyway if you're the first behavioral health person there. I, I often say we're the grit in the oyster. If we sit just in the right place, we could be a pearl. Otherwise, we're just grit. And, but you will change 
everybody's practice. And what discipline they come from is not a good guide for who does it well. It's, we can't, the, 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 the disciplines are elbowing each other and jockeying for mandates and you, how could you go forward unless you had this number of psychologists or this number of social workers or this number of something else? And the answer is no. It is a modular set of skills. It is, can you do the things we need to do to work here? And we are, and depression care managers have been MSWs, nurses, psychologists, NPs, PAs. It's really about uh, the passion and the modular set of skills. So this is what we're doing about it at UMass. We have, you know, I, I gave you a little flyer of our training programs. What we're trying to offer is a way of retraining people who are already trained to go from specialty mental health to working in primary care or to go from being either a case manager in mental health or a care manager only in health to being able to be an integrated care manager in the patient-centered uh, medical home. So that's, and we also are training folks to do motivational interviewing. I put in very, very small letters down there that there are other programs. <laughs> and there are. And I have to be honest about that. Um, but um, in fact, we are, we are the primary care training input for one of the doctoral programs, APA doctoral programs in the country. They just, everybody who's gonna do primary care track in the health psychology takes our course. Um, so that's a, that's a quick, um, quick run through. I, let me see if there's any of these notes that I feel like I just can't possibly, oh yes. Graduate students or graduate places really are interested in competencies. And the APA and my colleague Susan McDaniel came out with a list of competencies for primary care behavioral health. I like that list, but if you can do all those things, you're Perinda Katri. <laughs> you're not just some regular old person. It's a really high, bar. And what we found, I, I'm on a, a group for the Academy for Integration that went around and looked at the exemplar integrated sites in the U.S. And we brought um, folks who are, uh, gee, now I'm, I'm stuck on the, the phrase, I'm, I'm having word finding trouble. Napoleon Chagnon is an anthropologist. They were anthropological uh, ex um, ex experimenters or ob obser observers. And so they just watched and they just took all these notes. And my role there was there to say both what is important, but also what you're not seeing. By the way, you see what's happening in Cherokee? You won't see that anywhere else. This is, you really got to put a star around that. So one of the things that we found was as we look at competencies is that it is very hard to distinguish individual competencies from organizational competencies, and they don't work without each other. And I have always felt like I want to work in a system where an average person, Perinda's average psychiatrist, <laughs> average white man, uh, can do exceptional work because of the system. And so I think that that's an important piece and shouldn't be left out when we're talking about the competencies. And now I will shut up. Okay. So questions? So as a primary care physician, I just wanted to say how much I appreciated what you articulated. I haven't heard it worded that well about what we actually really do every day. It's, you did a good job with that. Thank you. Other questions? 
<clears throat> Excuse me. I was just wondering if you could speak to um, how you provide continuing education to other people on the team about um, behavioral health concerns. Um, just, I think um, I've been fortunate to work with a program where I work with physicians who really understand behavioral health, and I know that's true for so many physicians. I'm sure that there there's some variability to that. And um, so, how do you, you know, as a team, kind of um, help everybody to understand, and because there's so much stigma with mental health as well as with obesity and things like that. Um, the way you start, uh, you know, the, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. The way to a physician's heart is through their most irritating patient, the, the people that are the hardest for them. And you find a way to help the doctor with those patients and then they really want to know how you did it because they know you can't be there all the time. So you, the more you are helpful, the more they learn. But the other part is as, as you get protocols, teams that work in a protocol-driven fashion and exchange information regularly begin inevitably to exchange expertise. And so they're in, in one study of a a particular specialty, a obese kid specialty, they said that initially it took every member of the team, the nutritionist, the physician, the nurse, the psychologist, to do an intake. And after a year, any one of us could do the intake. That the expertise transfer is so great. And I think it's worth, we talked at lunch, one of the things people try and do is say, we're gonna get to these medical students and we'll get there early and we'll open their minds and then they won't be as gnarly as the docs we have now who are <laughs> over 30. And the answer is, no, they'll be just like anybody else around them because they're human being and they wanna be like their group. And the people that are, um, the people, when I train behavioral health people, people say, well, you have to train the docs. They're the ones who have to either accept it or not. Yes, you need medical leadership. Somebody's got to be saying, we're going to do this. On the other hand, the physicians in, pro in programs that are doing very well were not immensely more open when the program started than the physicians in programs that don't have behavioral health. They all had the, same, the similar kinds of training. They were generally flexible people or they wouldn't have stayed, but they learned on the job and they learned by working together and exchanging expertise. Over there. Well, you do, you're walking away from somebody. Oh, I'm sorry. Curious. <laughs> um, thanks. I was wondering if you could speak to sort of um, the breakdown of the the clients that are seen. Like, how many end up n meeting with the um, behavioral health specialist as well, or maybe even just like more of like yeah, a snapshot of who is seen by by which groups, like just to get more of a sense of like on the ground what it's looking like in your setting? Um, that's a function of the program. Um, how uh, mature the program is. So the more immature the program is, the more it'll be a mental health group. And the more mature the program is, the more it'll be just people with health struggles. The penetration number is a number that is a one that's a metric that's being used by integrated care uh, organizations. And it means what percentage of the people who are on our panel were touched in some way by behavioral health in the last year. And in our practice, it was 22%. And I think in yours, it's more like 28 or 30. 35%. 35 okay. And um, I never would have thought of that as a metric, but it, it is, it's, a, it's an important metric. Uh, Sandy, a great presentation. Uh, given your expertise, especially when it comes to training and the fact that we're about, well, we've already launched a new, the Dell Medical School. Now given that, obviously, we have here Ed Psych and with the interest here, what would you recommend, what is maybe one or two things that needs to happen from a curriculum standpoint or from 
any other perspective you might think that we should take advantage of given that a new medical school is about to kick off and here we are at the UT Austin Institute of Higher Education of really making sure the two work together. Oh, that's a hard one because you were talking about some land that I have never covered. Uh, I loved, we were sitting at the table and they, people were talking about using the, the um, resources of this university where they, you brought in people from the theater department to play, to play uh, patients. And I thought, gosh, that's so great. In Massachusetts, we put the medical school 60 miles from the main university because Worcester was due. And so they got the medical school. I mean, it's, it's, it's Massachusetts logic. Um, beyond that, though, I would say, if, in as much as I know, is drift toward doing it rather than telling about it. So the more it happens that you had to work as a team to solve this, and the more you learn something together, particularly if you have a situation in which the neophyte behavioral health person and the neophyte medical person have to work on something that they, together, I think that would be great. And what we found was we brought in second year clinical students uh, and made them, or made them available for dual interviews with our residents who are pretty advanced. They're just about finished with their training. And I was thinking, I, this is not gonna work. These, this second year person really doesn't know anything yet. And the residents found her quite useful, very helpful, because that's the level of, um, that, that added value for them. Thank you.